Thomas Hobbes was an English philosopher who had a pessimistic view of human nature. He said that war is the natural state of man. Now, a lot of people hearing that are not along with that statement, but really, how embedded is war in human nature? How inevitable is war? Is it just like eating and sleeping, something that just comes naturally to human beings, something embedded in our DNA? And are we getting more warlike or less warlike? The ongoing struggle in Ukraine has been described as the biggest European conflict since World War II, but although this seems hard to believe, the world's actually been becoming less warlike since the 1940s. The number of wars and lives lost to war has declined steeply since then. Gwyn Dyer is back on Conversations today. Gwyn is an historian and a commentator who served in three different navies, the US Navy, the Canadian Navy, and the Royal Navy of Great Britain. He's the author of many books on global politics, warfare, and technology. Gwyn notes that no great power has fought another directly in three quarters of a century, which he says is the longest interval in the past several thousand years. But things are changing as they always do. Gwyn Dyer's fascinating book is called The Shortest History of War. Hello, Gwyn. Hi, how are you? I'm well, well, sir. Just to start with Ukraine, just briefly, there's a couple of old cliches about war. They say that no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. Is this what's happened in Ukraine, in your view? Well, it's what happened, but in a much more spectacular case than usual. I mean, no battle plan survives for his contact. Yes, that's true. But you didn't spe- expect your whole army to collapse, which is effectively what happened with the Russian army invading Ukraine two months ago. I mean, they literally couldn't get moving after the first week because they had sent the army in on the assumption that it would be a knockover. You know, we'll go in, take the Ukrainian government down to three days, And then it would be time for the victory parade, and the Ukrainians won't resist. So after a week, they ran out of rations, they ran out of ammunition, they ran out of everything, and no provision had been made to bring supplies up against opposition with trucks getting picked off by Ukrainian squads with anti-tank and anti-vehicle weapons. So the whole thing stalled, and they never got it going again, which is why, in the end, it became clear you couldn't actually put this back together. It was too much of a mess. The forces, the Russian forces, scattered all over the place, taking casualties every day. No possibility of getting that moving again. So they moved to the east, which is where they're now attacking. But again, very poor preparation. Troops who are fighting up north of Kiev, west of Kiev, have been sent around to the far east of the country, the Donbass, to fight there. But they could put right back into combat right away. You, you can't expect people to go on for two months with no rest, no break. So the Russians are more or less stuck. I mean, they outnumber the U- Ukrainians hugely. Their weapons are not inferior, though they're certainly not superior. And it's back to almost trench warfare like World War I with huge casualties on the Russian side. I know the Ukrainians are taking a lot of casualties, but nothing like the same number. I do begin to believe that the number that the Ukrainians are quoting which was 22,000 Russian dead in two months, is probably correct because the number of dead bodies they found that the Russians left behind, 7,000, is about the number of troops that the Russians say are missing. Do you have a view on what should be done in order to bring the war to an end? Is it best to try and utterly defeat someone like Vladimir Putin, or is it best, given the weapons he has at his disposal, to make a provision for some kind of face-saving withdrawal? Well, let's consider who is making the decisions here, because it is not us in the sense of all those who support Ukraine, and I support Ukraine. They did nothing to deserve this. 
it's the Ukrainians who are making these decisions about what point would we be willing to stop the war at if we're winning, if we're losing. Well, you know, then we don't have the choice somebody else does, and maybe we'd have to make a deal. But at the moment, they are at least level pegging, and I would say on a winning trajectory, because I don't think the Russians have a lot more to throw at them without declaring mass mobilization. And that would just bring in a flood of untrained or almost completely untrained soldiers. The reserves in Russia don't get exercised regularly. And it would either be a slaughter of the innocent or another three months while they try to train those people up to be, you know, the the reserves to be reasonably useful, if not very useful, on the battlefield. So the Ukrainians have to decide what point they are willing to stop at. No. The only reason they would stop short of taking back everything the Russians have seized since 2014, when they took Crimea and much of the Donbass, is if they see that they cannot actually do it without too big a butcher's bill, too many Ukrainian soldiers killed, or that going that far and just trying to reset the clock to early 2014, before the first Russian invasion, would likely trigger nuclear weapons use by the Russians. Putin. That's a consideration. I can't make those decisions. Even the Americans can't. That's, in the end, a Ukrainian decision. And I think it'll be made on a purely pragmatic basis. Of course, they'd like it all back. But, you know, how many lives are we willing to spend for that? The minimum cost, minimum demand would be the the frontiers as uh, lines of control as of 23rd February this year before the Russians rolled in this time. The thing that you can see in common with dictators like Vladimir Putin or Saddam Hussein or Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin, the thing, they, they have this remarkably common worldview, which is that the world is a veil of tears. It's a cruel struggle for supremacy or survival. That's just how it is. And anyone talking about compassion is either a liar or a, a hypocrite. What do you make of that worldview and whether there might be any truth in that? Oh, there's a good deal of truth in that. I mean, you you know the phrase, nature read in tooth and claw. Well, it was. We come from a long line of human and pre-human, our more distant ancestors, people who lived in that world and just accepted that that's the way it was. And I would say that that, that view of the world as a, a, a permanent battlefield where the strong win and the weak go to the wall was almost universal until less than a hundred, well, just about a hundred years ago. So everybody would have agreed with that view that winners win, losers go to the wall, and everybody has to be prepared to fight to defend their turf. War is natural, recurrent. You have to be good at it if you want to survive. Everybody shared that view. In fact, you know, it was institutionalized in our societies. One of the principal responsibilities of the state was to be good at fighting wars, and to be good at fighting wars was glorious. So it's not just dictators. Everybody used to behave like that. I would say dictators now are a bit archaic in their views. What Putin thinks now is what Otto von Bismarck thought when he unified Germany. It is what the British fought, thought when they were building their empire. It's, you know, I mean, here, they can't defend themselves. Let's take them over. That's what the Romans thought and it's what the Assyrians thought. So this is where we have to kind of wind the clock right back, right back, even before the dawn of humanity. And this is what you've done in your book. Let's talk about chimpanzees. Chimps are our closest relatives as a species. They're pretty warlike, aren't they, Gwyn? Well, they are, although we didn't realize it until recently. I mean, you know, the the view was that, again, until relatively recently, maybe 50 years ago in this case, that while war is inevitable, it's a, an artifact of civilization. Um, we evil civilized people fight wars 
pre-civilized peoples are noble savages. That was the phrase, you know. They don't do that. They might have, you know, little contests to win honor and so on, but they don't really fight wars like us. Hippies are the forests and, and fields. and Hippies are the forests and the fields, except their <laughs> drugs weren't nearly as good as ours. <laughs> and, and that uh, other that wild animals did not, because that would imply purpose, that would imply organization, all the things we thought wild animals did not have. So it was a bit of a startling discovery. First of all, a woman who called Jane Goodall, whom you may be familiar with, <laughs> was studying chimpanzees in East Africa in the 19, I think it was 60s. It was a long time ago now. And, you know, the way you study chimpanzees or other primates is to get to know them and follow them around and give them names and see what each one does and, you know, all that primatological stuff. And she discovered that though chimpanzees never fight battles, they do wage war. The reason they don't fight battles is because actually it's very hard for one chimpanzee to kill another. You know, no, they don't have weapons. The most they might have is a rock. And the odds on being killed in a one-on-one -on -one contest, if you are a chimpanzee, are pretty low because it's hard to kill. But they're even for either side, so there's no percentage in going around having fights to the death. So you need a gang of chimps to kill a single chimp. You need a gang of chimps, but the thing about chimpanzees and many other predator, predator species is that they live in groups, although they have to split up to forage to go and find food. So there's a reasonable chance that a group of chimpanzees from one band will on occasion come across a single chimpanzee from another band. And the point is, they're always at war in the sense that if you get a chance to knock off a male, or even a female, but it's more often the males, much more often, um, you take it. And six or seven will jump one from the other band and basically beat him to death. You know, they jump on him, they bite him, they kick him, they pick him up and drop him, they beat him with rocks, and they leave him for dead and go home. They do not eat him, interestingly. This is, I mean, they do hunt prey, but they do not eat their own kind. Mm, that's a taboo there. That's interesting, that's isn't it? That's mm. interesting, too. Mm. Um, but, of course, over time, given that they uh, live in, you know, fairly small areas, and by the way, they always live right in the middle of the area, going to the edges of the areas where you might encounter the next group, is so dangerous that you don't exploit the resources there, except in very large groups. So there's a demilitarized zone that's observed by chimps. There's a DMZ. Right, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Every, around every chimp zone. It's not demilitarized. If you're there <laughs> and alone, you might get killed. So anyway, she discovered that. Great, very striking discovery. You know, they, they fight wars. And it, on occasion, it goes to the point where all or almost all of the male chimps on one ba in one band are eliminated, at which point there's a takeover bid. You kill the rest and you kill the, the, the small children because you want to have your own children instead with the females whom you don't kill. So it's really ugly stuff. But of course, at the same time, over there, another bunch of people were realizing that human beings were not noble savages, that in fact they fought wars of extermination and they were doing it since before we were recognizably human, but all the way down through hunter-gatherer human history, all, what, 300,000 years of it? So humans are no different, no matter where you find them. We know this now. But the societies they live in are different. How does the dynamic work when it comes to how warlike a group of hunter-gatherer people is when, with an alpha male in the group or an absence of an alpha male? Well, the alpha males are actually, it's not elected exactly, but it does cha change hands. It's not hereditary. They're not kings, no. They're not, no. They're, they age out and then they get replaced or they get injured and they can't fight anymore, so they get replaced and that sort of thing. But once you're a member of the band, that's your home and everybody else in the world, every other human in the world is potentially an enemy and there are, again, DMZs, the exactly the same areas that you are comfortable in in the middle of your, your of your territory and areas you would never go alone in and the edges of your territory in these wars which in the human case do often involve group on group because now we've got weapons that kill at a distance so bows and arrows spears things like that the uh, casualty rate is about 30 percent of them were killed in war the males 
which is almost exactly the same proportion that you find in chimpanzees, and higher than any war has, that has ever been fought by a human country. But do you say at some point there's some kind of a breakthrough when it comes to us humans as opposed to chimps? I mean, we, we're different. We're not the same as chimps. We have language. We uh, have bigger brains. We're more intelligent. Tell me how early humans learned to protect themselves from the tyrant of the alpha male who might be ruling that band of humans, wherever that may be in the world. Well, something that happened, and we don't know when it happened, but we can sort of say it certainly didn't happen before human beings had language. So somewhere between 110,000 years ago and 10,000 years ago, human beings' language was good enough that they were able to do something quite extraordinary, which was to overthrow the tyrant male, the, the typical primate bus man who ascends the ladder to power by being stronger or more cunning than all the others, building alliances with the other males, becomes the boss man, and tyrannizes the rest, tries to monopolize sex with the females and all the rest of it. So it's once we have sophisticated language that then that means the other men in the tribe can get together and have a conversation about, about this unpleasant man. Exactly. Why are we letting him, um, you know, uh, run our lives? And by the way, there's no point in just overthrowing him, uh, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. You know, if we just go on like this, the vast majority of us will always be oppressed, beaten up, humiliated. What we need to do is make sure nobody takes control. And we all cut down the tall poppies. And anybody who gets out of line and starts giving orders, we take them down. So this is why hunter-gatherer societies tend to be so absolutely relentlessly egalitarian and proceed by absolute consensus and consultation. This is why hunter-gatherer decision-making is so intensely long and boring. Everybody gets their say as many times as they want about, you know, about anything. And decisions are only by consensus. But it's going to be a better decision then too, isn't it, by and large? Because everyone's thrashed it out then, haven't they? Well, it may be better. Maybe it isn't better. Maybe they all had the wrong idea in their head and they agree on doing something wrong. But the point is, we don't let anybody take charge of us. We will make decisions this way because that way we are free men and women, because women are included in these conversations. So what kind of penalties can be exerted on any man who thinks he might try and become the alpha male in that Well, situation? mockery is the first one, usually. <laughs> you know, You're know, you describing he Australia think? here, Gwen. You know that, don't you? This is uh, well, what we of have course it is. Why, do, why have you got such a flourishing democracy there? You know, because you all, <laughs> nobody gets away with, you know, putting airs on. Nobody gets yeah. away with saying, I'll take charge here. It's not pretty, um, though. It's not a pretty democracy, Gwen. <laughs> it's, listen, I grew up in Canada, I can tell you all about it. Um, um, so mockery does the thing. That, that's one mockery, of the things. Well, right? No, it doesn't yeah. always. Yeah. Mockery does the thing, but if the mockery doesn't work, exile comes next. And if exile doesn't work, you gang up on the, the guy and kill him. I mean, you know, it does happen. There is ex This happened both in, in human hunter-gatherer groups. There are killing. I mean, they, they're heavily armed men. There are no laws. Of course, you know, if, if you get the ultimate sanction is available to everybody. And if somebody is getting too big for their boots and taking over, he, you know, and it doesn't submit to being exiled and doesn't respond to mockery, I'm sorry, we'll take him down. So you're saying then there are, there are two basic models then, very, very basic prototypes for social organization in humans. There's the one where there's the alpha male bully tyrant at the top of the heap, terrorizing everyone and keeping everyone in line, having sex with whoever he feels like. And then there's this other model, this more egalitarian model. where The revolutionary model. Right. The, the revolution what, what's, model. <laughs> what's called, actually, by some primatologists, the reverse dominance model. Because the point is, we're not going to let ourselves be dominated. We collectively are going to dominate all the potential alpha males and cut them, them off at the knees that they try to take over. So we have these hunter-gatherer societies and these two different forms of, of organizing them. Then we get the agricultural revolution where people learn how to sow grain in the ground, how to grow crops, and that means staying in the one place and, and piling up a surplus possibly on a, in a good season as well. How does that change things in terms of how we organize and conflict with each other? Well, first of all, it creates property. 
Karl Marx noticed this, but somebody, a great many other people noticed it first. If, if you own things and you are tied to a single place, owning those things becomes extremely important. Hunter-gatherers don't own much. They own what they can carry, which is, you know, a, a not very long-lasting supply of food and weapons. But there's a freedom in that too, isn't there? Well, there's huge freedom in that, but there's a good deal of risk as well. You have a really good time for a very short time, and you're dead at 35 or 40. But the the mass societies, which are actually scrawny, diminutive, underfed societies for the most of history are places where you only know the people in your vicinity, whereas the boss knows everything about all of you. I mean, by having every empire, every monarchy historically has ways of knowing what people are up to that are not available across, you know, the, look, sort of information travels upward. It does not travel downwards and it does not travel laterally because the, there is no communications that are available beyond the their immediate vicinity. So once you get settled people, though, once we have settled agricultural people, that leaves them open to the depredations of raiders, doesn't it? Like Vikings, Turkic peoples from the steppe, like the Huns and the Mongols and the Avars and so on. Also the Bedouin Arabs, for example, people who live much more mobile, nomadic lives, who are herdsmen. This leaves the settling people, the people who are settlers, uniquely vulnerable, doesn't it? And what comes out of that? It does. Well, actually, I mean, you know, nobody... When we first settled, we began farming the land. We did not... And we acquired and domesticated animals... But the herdsmen, the nomads, as we sometimes call them, though they don't wander at random, they tend to migrate between one area and another, depending on when the spring comes and the new grass rises and all the rest of it. The raiders who overthrew half the empires of human history, coming off the steppes and so on, are a a secondary effect of going civilized, because what happens is, of course, that you do have herds of animals. You don't want them in among the farming areas. They'll trample the crops. And so some people get told off to take the, the animals up the hills in the in the springtime and, and bring them back in the autumn. You're still going to be part of the, gra- the group, but, you know, you are the herdsman. And it occurs to the herdsman at some later point, but probably not all that much later, why are we taking orders from the farmers? We can just go off with our herds. Now, admittedly, if we go off with our herds and run our own lives, we won't have, you know, metals and things like that that require a fixed address. But that's all right, because we can raid them for that. And we move much faster than they do. You know, they have to be on their farms. We can all be together anywhere we want and outnumber them locally. We can raid. And so you get this this sort of waves of conquest coming off the nomad areas, if you like, the steppes and so on, the herdsmen and their animals with them coming into civilized areas, raping, murdering, looting, retreating to the steppe, and then at a somewhat later time discovering, well, we can actually just take the whole thing over and sit in a palace and eat grapes. And run it like a protection racket, actually, just extort money out of them. Does this then lead, though, the, the, settling, the settled people to defend themselves with armies? Is This is when we get start to get an army, is it, at this it, point? It's more complicated than that, and also we don't know. I mean, armies appear about 5,000 years ago. The first states probably do not arise until about, well, 6,000 years ago, let us say, the very first. And about 5,000 years ago, you see the first armies appearing, armies that will actually stand in ranks in numbers at least of hundreds, probably thousands, and stand and fight for five or ten minutes, even though people are going down every minute. Nobody's ever fought like that before, not chimpanzees, not human beings. That's real grown-up war. What about military discipline, Gwyn? What about that? When does that start to come into play here, where where you actually have soldiers standing in rows, ranks and rank and file of, of soldiers who are trained to not lose their nerve, who are trained to stand fast, to hold up their shields and then press forward against the, the enemy? Well, I think, I mean, what is being exploited here to persuade these men, and we're talking principally of men, of course, in this, what's being exploited is the fact that one of the most important things for any adult is the view others, other adults around him have of his qualities, his worth, 
his, among other things, his courage, his dedication. And men will die for that. Rather than show myself a coward, I will take this terrible chance because I have my friends around me and I don't want them to see me fail. So this is honor. This is military valor, is it? It is. It is. And, and you know, you we all know of case, cases of people who will die rather than, I mean, they don't generally have to carry through with it, but you know they would die in a ditch rather than quit, give up, be humbled, accept that they're wrong. <laughs> This is part of, you know, our nature. You know, it comes from the kind of front you've got to put up if you live in a highly competitive society where there is a pecking order. And so everybody's got a bit of that in them. There are, you know, there have been pecking orders for a very long time in, in human and pre-human societies. And the order of ranks changes out once in a while. You climb the ladder. But it, it does involve putting up a front. Uh, you know, I am tough, I am not afraid. And generally it works. I mean, if you ever went to school, which I presume you did, you know that, you know, in the playground, you've always got to look tough enough that people don't take you on. So you can exploit that to uh, make an army stand and fight even when you're going to get 20, 30% casualties in 10 minutes. Broadcast. Broadcast. This is Conversations with Richard Feidler. Now, what about officers, the whole idea of an officer, a colonel, a lieutenant, a general, a centurion, if you like? What's the thinking behind there when you have uh, the development of an officer class and what they're for, Gwyn? Well, generally speaking, officer classes emerge from the social classes of civilian society. There is a nobility of some sort in most monarchies or empires, and that's what we have mostly in the first 5,000 years of our history as civilized societies. Obviously, they take charge because you wouldn't want anybody else in charge of a dangerous army. And also, by and large, military forces are commanded by people who are on the side of the ruler. I mean, that is important as well. So the origins of the officer class have to do with making the monarch or the emperor safe uh, by making sure the military are ruled by people who are on his side. Never actually sure, you can be sure, they're ambitious and they might overthrow you, but it's better than letting the masses control the army themselves. So they start out in this supervisory role on behalf of the monarch, but why is there the need, perceived need, to have them socially separated from the men, the, 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 the basic soldiers? It turns out, you see, that that's a good arrangement in terms of military efficiency, because somebody has to be in charge. You cannot have a democracy decision in the army, in, the, in any army. Decisions need to be made. Complex decisions that will get people killed need to be made on inadequate information very fast. That's how you win, war, win wars or lose them, by failing to do that. So there's an enormous psychological burden that's placed on any officer with a conscience thing. Well, I mean, I've, 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 I remember I was interviewing a fellow called Paul Fussell, an American writer who served as an infantry officer in the Second World War, and he talked about how you have to de keep your distance from your soldiers. He was a sufficiently junior new soldier that he, officer, that he knew all their names. You get close to them, you care about them, but you have to withhold your affection. I'm quoting him almost literally. You have to withhold your affection because sometimes you have to order them to do things that will get them killed. 
And that is the thing. You, you need that distance because your job is to organize activities in which some of them, and sometimes you even choose who's going to take point and is going to be the likeliest to get killed. And you have to be fair about that, make sure that, the, you know, it rotates between the, the you know people. It's not always the same guy out front. But you are choosing people and putting them into mortal danger. And the best way to do that is to maintain a certain distance from them and to have a rank that removes you from being just one of them. So it's not an aristocratic hangover then. It's actually uh, it's, it's actually instituted that separation for practical purposes. It, yeah, it originated as an aristocratic privilege and another way of keeping them out, you know, off the streets. Those, you know, you don't want the aristocrats who haven't real jobs hanging around and thinking about their resentments and their ambitions and to getting together and overthrowing you. So putting them in the army, oddly enough, keeps them busy and keeps them away from the towns. But it turns out that it is actually socially very effective. The thing that armies generate or fighting together generates, ideally you have those bonds of incredible loyalty selflessness. You know, we hear this all the time in the face of death and mayhem and horror and all of those things. The military virtues of fortitude and courage and selflessness, which of course are by no means always observed, but when they are, it's it's incredibly moving. Isn't it a weird thing for people to be so loving while fighting and killing and dying? Any war I've ever been near, and I've been near a few, you will find people saying versions of that. The closer you get to the front line, there is this almost gaiety, this friendliness, this helpfulness. You're you're in a very extreme situation, stripped down to the basics of your humanity, and you take, among other, you t- you take refuge in the company of those undergoing this with you, and they become loved and lovable. I've heard that said so many different ways, that men are never so kind and loving as when they are in combat. Now, of course, it doesn't mean men, it means people, but then that's the way the language is used traditionally within the military. There's no time in combat for the petty concerns of every day. And so basic things come to the fore, and among the basic things is our need for company and support and approval. And love. And love. This brings us to one of the most profound taboos that exists among humans. War requires people, we require our armies to, our soldiers, to violate this fundamental taboo, which is to destroy another human life. We, we absolutely require our soldiers to do this. How typically have soldiers dealt with the need or being asked to violate this terrible fundamental taboo? taboo that says, I must not take another person's life? Well, I suspect they didn't get away with violating it as long as they had to fight shoulder to shoulder in a sort of British battalion at Waterloo or um, or indeed in even the First World War, you know, because you're always observed by those around you. You cannot fail to kill the other side even though you have an possibly unrecognized huge reluctance to take human life. You can go back into, we can't get back much much further than the 19th century with this stuff because common soldiers by and large didn't leave records before that time. But it was it's quite noticeable the first time you, you can actually document that some soldiers, quite a lot of soldiers, are avoiding killing the enemy is the American Civil War. And I don't think it's because the Americans are more nice than other people. I think it's just that there's evidence because you're using muzzle-loading rifles so that the, the process of loading the weapon is very visible. They can see you're doing it, and once you've fired, you've got to do it again. Obviously, you could just aim over people's heads and who's going to know you? A lot of black powder smoke all around the place and, you know, lots of other guns going off. But one of the things that did happen, and they found this out after, I think, the Battle of Gettysburg, they collected all the weapons. It was a murderous battle. 20 or 30,000 people killed on the two sides. They dropped their weapons. So they're going around the battlefield afterwards collecting all these 
abandoned muskets, and they're finding that many of them have been double or triple loaded. There were some that had up to six charges in them, six balls rammed down one after the other. If you tried to fire that weapon, you'd blow your own head off because people were going through the loading motions you couldn't fail to do that without attracting the immediate personal attention of the sergeant in charge of you, but you didn't shoot it. So are you saying that there are people in the US Civil War, and maybe by extension in other wars, they will be there on the battlefield, they will not run from it, they will face enemy fire, they will load their weapons and expose themselves to mortal peril and die rather than shoot the fire their weapon and kill another person and have that on their conscience? Yeah. That's what happened. It's an amazing I, thought, Quinn. Isn't that an extraordinary thing? It's quite encouraging, really, isn't yeah. it? I mean, but it's true. And I think the reason that you're starting to get in the Civil War battlefield is that although they are still fighting sort of within sight of each other and in fairly clumped up, you know, the, the groups are not spread out very widely like modern soldiers are. You know, there's standard battlefield rules now is don't be within five meters of anybody else. We don't want to lose you all at once, so spread out, guys. This was already happening in the American Civil War. But this is a civil war, and civil wars are a bit special, and there is this terrible grief that often plays out in a civil war. Can you say the same thing has happened, though, this unwillingness to shoot to kill, to be present, to be exposed to danger, but not not being willing to shoot to kill? Is there evidence that that has been present in other wars? Well, it becomes evident in the Second World War. By now, the dispersion on the battlefield is such that if you don't want to kill, you can avoid it. They won't see you not shooting. In very many cases, nobody's watching the other people around them. They're ducking or they're looking at who's coming at them. So you are unobserved, essentially, in your own foxhole. And at that point, in the Second World War, they started doing post-combat questionnaires, military historians. A fellow called General Marshall, who'd fought in the First World War, was in charge of military history in the Second World War. He started handing out questionnaires, doing post-combat debriefs in person, and discovers lots and lots of the soldiers. These were anonymous, so they could tell the truth, these interviews, that a lot of the soldiers never killed anybody, never aimed at anybody, never fired at anybody, fired over their heads or not at all. Well, this is terribly moving, Gwyn, but the problem is we do require soldiers to shoot to kill, don't we? I mean, we can't get around this. I mean, this is the horrible truth of it. I mean... The armies need you to do it, but the the soldiers weren't doing it. And, and it's not just the nice soldiers or the soldiers in the nice armies. Because if the American or the British or the Australian army had been doing it, that, you know, full of, full of people who won't really kill anybody and are not taking part in the combat, they're just pretending they don't want to kill anybody. If Australians and Americans and Brits had not been doing that and the Germans and the Japanese had all been killing... They would have won. We, you, they'd have won. Right. So, so clearly, you know, Nazi soldiers, soldiers of the Japanese Empire, were equally reluctant in significant numbers to kill. So once this problem had been identified after the war, if you want to call it a problem, uh, I suppose it is as far as an army is concerned, what changes did the United States Army make to its basic training procedure in order to remedy this situation? Well, actually, you just do basic psychology and a whole lot of uh, essentially laying down reflex pathways. You drop, for example, a long grassy field with a round target at the bullseye at the end of it for your fire practices, and instead you make them walk through a field where pop-up targets will appear for about three seconds, and if you don't shoot it within three seconds, it's, got, it's down again and you're marked down. And so you're building a reflex pathway. See the enemy shoot. Don't think about it. So you bypass a moral response then. You try to, you try to work, navigate around it and instill other categories of behavior. If you look at basic training now, it addresses the issue of killing in a way that it never did before the Second World War or even now until before the Korean War come to that. Does this go some way to explaining the very high and terrible degree of post-traumatic stress disorder suffered, in particular by Vietnam veterans who came into battle after this new regime of shooting first, bypassing the moral sensor had been introduced? I think it entirely explains it. I think that there was, there was a lot of post-coma... I mean, you know, there's other ways to get PTSD. 
right? You can get PTSD in a civilian life and, you know, terrible accident of some sort. It comes in various varieties. But the suicide rates among combat veterans post-1950, let us say, are completely beyond anything you saw in the veterans of previous wars. I mean, there's, there's, there are people who are not at all impeded and encumbered with these, this desire not to kill. They, they're not murderous or wicked people, but they don't have a particular moral problem or even an emotional problem with killing somebody if it's the appropriate circumstances. He's my enemy. I'm entitled and required to kill him. Bang. But there's lots of people who don't have that kind of equipment and are appalled by what they're being asked to do and will avoid doing it or will do it because they've been trained sufficiently, the reflex pathways have been laid down, and then hate themselves for the rest of their lives. I think the armies are even beginning to recognize that it's this now, though it's very difficult to recognize because it was you guys who gave them this problem. So does this training then, and then putting a soldier into the field after that, I think you say something along the lines that this actually has the effect of destroying their identity, their previous identity as a civilian. Well, you break down the the identity and you rebuild it again, incorporating Mm. military values. I mean, it is a conversion phenomenon. Basic training is not about learning how to strip a gun. It's learning how to pull the trigger. I went through basic training. And I know I was a different person afterwards. It, my original personality didn't vanish. It had been modified and for a period significantly repressed. It all came back. And that's normal. With a few different loyalties added on and a few reflexes imbued. But I was still me. Pity about that. But there you go. You have to get what, take what you get. It, it doesn't turn you into a different person, but it is a conversion process, which will wear off in time for most people, particularly if they don't spend the rest of their lives in a military environment. But in the course of being in the military environment, many of them are required to kill people. Now, you don't actually always know who you killed when you're in a battle. In fact, most people don't. Um, unless they happen to get close up and personal, which does happen. But you know that you were trying to kill people, and you know you probably did if you were at it long enough. And it is a burden for some people, maybe even most people. So what happens when we have the introduction of something like drone warfare, where you can have a serviceman sitting in Milwaukee or Wichita uh, or somewhere like that, piloting a drone like it's some kind of video game that can then unleash some all kinds of airborne mayhem on people who are being attacked, where civilians might inadvertently be killed or almost certainly will be killed. But they won't need to see the consequences, the human consequences. That guy sitting in Milwaukee won't need to see the consequences of the destruction that's been unleashed by the drone. How does this change things to your mind, Wynn? Well, I I think it does make it easier to do. I mean, it, it really depends. Drones are used for two purposes. Right now in Ukraine, drones are being used to take out military equipment. And there's a big explosion in flames, and you may see somebody running from the scene, but mostly won't even see the bodies. And in any case you know, you're in a military context. Now, when you're, you know, back in Afghanistan or something like that, and you're operating a drone and you're following some person you want to take out for days and you find him in his village up in the hills somewhere and wait for orders to take him out and you can see him going to, you know, taking his children out to play and all the rest of it. And then you put your weapon down on him and you see the his family run to him. And maybe five five hours later, or three hours or one hour later, you're told to do a second tap, as they call it, and put another weapon down on the mourners, because they must be in cahoots with this guy you killed. That gets very personal. And probably in some people has severe moral and, and emotional effects, and in others, not at all. I've heard senior officers or retired officers in various armies say that drones are a kind of a poison into the whole ethics of warfare. They they fly in the face of everything they'd learnt about military valour and military honour. What do you think about that? I think there is something to it because the the one thing that redeems what soldiers do, which is kill people, is that they are equally vulnerable themselves to being killed. I mean... guy called Sir John Hackett, a former British general, very nice guy, 
once said, you know, the, the point is that the soldier volunteers to be slain. He lays down his life. And that validates and in, and enables him to take the lives of others. He has skin in the game. And, of course, that equation doesn't apply to the drone operator who will never, or at least not while he's wearing that hat, doing that job. He'll clock off at night, 5 o'clock in Wichita and go and see his family, and that'll be it. That's right, exactly. I mean, you know, now this is not what's happening to the Ukrainian drone operator at the moment or his Russian equivalent, but, you know, that is very often the case. On the other hand... Uh, we've been killing at a distance. Artillery has been killing people they cannot see for a hundred and hundred years at least, more than that, hundred and fifty years. Bomber command in World War Two, dropping bombs on civilians from forty thousand feet or thirty thousand feet. That's definitely killing people you cannot see. In the case of Bomber Command, there's about 50% fatal casualties among the air crew, so the old military equation still applies. But killing people you cannot see is easier than killing people you can't see, that's for sure. I mentioned right at the start that there has not been a war between great powers in the world for seven decades or so, not since the end of the Second World War, which is an unusual reprieve. And we know that's largely because of the nuclear stalemate. The use of powerful nuclear weapons makes war completely unacceptable, or in any case, amongst uh, senior leaders. And that's kept the peace. You say that things are changing now. What's changing? Well, things are in danger of changing, but I don't actually say they have changed yet because the, the taboo continues to apply. The United States is not at war with Russia. The, the point is that they're avoiding fighting each other because they are afraid they cannot control the escalation once they start killing the other side's own people. And at that point, you're in danger of going nuclear, and going nuclear is absolutely unthinkable but entirely possible physically, organizationally, and technologically. So the taboo is still being observed. But, you know, the taboo is allowing people to do what they really want to do anyway, because even non-nuclear war between great powers had become so destructive by 1945 that nobody wanted to go there again. Every country from Germany East in Europe, lost between 10 and 20% of its population killed in the course of that war. That is getting back up to hunter-gatherer casualty rates, but done in a much shorter period of time. We don't want to go there. We smash too much. We kill too many people. The nuclear weapon, in a way, enables you to leap over all the old institutions and say, sorry, you can't do that anymore. We can't have that kind of wars. But here's the problem. I think the thing you're talking about there presumes quite a few things. And one is that, that the world is reasonably stable. And the second thing is that the leaders aren't crazy psychopaths. I mean, it made no sense really for Putin to invade Ukraine. Not really. It made no sense for Saddam Hussein to invade Kuwait. People predicted he was going to back off. But yet there's a certain kind of leader that cannot help himself. And maybe we have to we have to sort of if they've if they've managed to burrow their way into high office into into certain parts of the world, then we we have to factor that into account, don't we? But you know, this is this is a problem that you're not going to solve. You're only going to contain it. You know, you can't you can't make it go away until you get to the point where there are no countries that allow that kind of person to get into power. And that is probably not going to happen tomorrow, is it? So in the meantime, you, you build fire breaks and you educate your military in the consequences of going too far and make sure they understand that their job is actually not just to do whatever the leadership says, and we're never going to say this aloud, but you will understand that I want you to understand this, that your job is not to use nuclear weapons. Quite explicitly, 
not to use nuclear weapons. Oh, God, Gwen, we've got to hope these conversations are being held. You know, this is what it feels like. We've got to go, well, I certainly hope these conversations are being held. Um, I, I had the privilege back in the, well, doubtful privilege back in, in a long time ago, now 1980s. I was making a film, a uh, whole series on war, and uh, I spent about a month in the Soviet Union, and I had unique access to the Soviet armed forces. And I, I talked to Soviet generals about deterrence and they said they they understood it all they understood exactly the kinds of rules that americans had also made for themselves i think the americans pioneered the rules because they got nukes first but the rules you know you must not do that you must signal your intentions you must be absolutely clear on what you're doing once you get to this point make sure the other side understands and do nothing irretrievable irreversible because you're responsible for the fate of the world and, and yes, I think they do. They do understand that. I, I've talked to senior people, of course, in, in other countries, not Chinese, but anywhere else, Britain, France, America, where that have nuclear weapons, and they do get it. So it doesn't you, mean it can't happen, but it is really well buffered. So if I'm to draw one lesson, if that's the word from your history of war, it's that humans are not doomed to fight each other to extinction, that there's always an alternative. There's, there's like another door we can walk through in this. It's a process. We are in the middle of a process in which we are weaning ourselves off big state war. I don't think we're going to eliminate all violence in the world or even all political violence, not even all international organized political violence. But in terms of the big wars, the penny has dropped, and we do understand that the technology makes them a no-go area. Now, it doesn't mean it can't happen, but the likelihood of it happening in any given year or decade is way down. Not going there at all, which we have succeeded to do for 77 years now. Well, I'm should be our highest priority. Well, I'm feeling vaguely more optimistic about the I think way things are going. I, I, I think you should be. I'm much more optimistic <laughs> than I was 20 years ago. I'll tell you that. <laughs> That's good to hear. It's been always wonderful to speak with you, Gwen, and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. It's, it's always a pleasure with you. For more episodes, hit subscribe or grab the ABC Listen app and listen to this show and many others all ad free.